concern for me, I would say worldwide, uh, it's very apparent to me um, that the environmental uh, crisis is, is, as I always thought, quite truly a crisis and that it's um, reaching various tipping points that um, are, uh, uh, and that's troublesome and, and I'm, I'm a little concerned how it will affect humanity, of course, and, and the devotees in different situations in different places of the world. Um, so anyway, uh, a little bit about that. Otherwise, I'd like to comment on the last week I gave a talk and talked about an internal issue of the Sangha. And subsequently, I spoke with Padmanabh Maharaj for an hour and a half, and Buddha was there. And it went very well, I thought. But afterwards, subsequently, Maharaj felt uh, some issues weren't dealt with, apparently. And um, instead of going on his continuing on his trip as planned, which I'd encouraged, he went to Latin America. And um, I, I, I think his discontent has been shared with some devotees and they have some concerns. And so um, I love Maharaj, but um, I don't uh, share the same um, opinion that some have uh, arrived at and I have good reasons for that. And if, I'd just like to say at this point, if any, any of uh, my disciples would like to really understand my perspective on the issue entirely and so forth, they, they can give me a call. Uh, and what they can do is they can email me and say they'd like to call me and then I'll, I'll give them my number and they can call me on WhatsApp and I'll explain to them uh, my perspective and um, my concerns and, and so forth. And um, and that we share my uh, affection for them and um, and my perspective on on the teaching and so forth, which is which is paramount. So I'm open to that. I'm happy to talk with, with anyone and um, and hear their hear their concerns and, and, and uh, anyway, give them the voice. So let's let's let me leave it at that on that particular issue if we can, and then. Um, Take any questions. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, okay, so um, everyone, I just have one question. So if you have a question, uh, please message me. Um, so the one question is from Brigu, and he is uh, driving. And so he wanted me to ask. So he said, uh, so Bhagavad said, I would like to ask about differentiating between the Atma and the Jiva. Brenda Renya does that in her articles, but I haven't seen that done before in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Is that a new development? Are there older precedents for that? You know, I don't know if I could cite any older precedent, but I know that Satnarayan Das Babaji himself has made that distinction. Um, and I think it's appropriate also in terms of the language. Jiva means a living, living being. And a living being can pertain to obviously our biological, uh, empirical, if you will, biological, psychological reality. And an atma um, you know, re refers to, to consciousness itself. Whereas the jiva can refer to any being in, in, in relative to their, their, um, their uh, conditioned life and, and so forth. Um, so there, there, I know there's a distinction in that sense. Um, I guess, you know, you could also argue that the word Atma um, has various meanings. Um, it, it can mean the Paramatma, it can mean the individual Atma, but sometimes it could be referred to as as, as the mind, but uh, more typically, um, it refers to consciousness uh, proper it's, itself. And the word jiva unto itself does not. So I think the distinction is there. And, uh, and as I say, Babaji Sadhana Ryan has, has made that clear distinction himself. And I think she may have picked that up from his writing and uh, footnoted it accordingly in her, in her thesis. That said, of course, that there, there is obviously a, a differentiation between the conditioned uh, atma and one that's, one that's unconditioned. And there are characteristics 
that are extrinsic relating to its conditioned life and characteristics that are intrinsic, uh, if you will, and relating to its, its, its liberated life. One of the emphasis is in, in Bernard Rania's thesis is that liberation can't be achieved without bhakti. Hmm? Therefore, if there are certain inherent qualities of the jiva that pertain to its liberated state, hmm, then, um, then that's a condition in which the jiva has bhakti. Hmm? So those qualities would be unmanifest hmm, if, uh, if it was not liberated. Hmm? If it was liberated, well, it would have bhakti and its intrinsic qualities would be manifest. So it's, it's an interesting argument. And I think in her article on Monday coming out, she starts to get into, into some, some, some really more complex philosophical depth on the issue. The, issue, the articles that she's published so far are more or less like broader, general, and introductory. So something to look forward uh, there. Um, that's my answer. Now we have to search for another, another question. Right. I, I got some. I got so we're good. Okay. Um, Sajan has a question. Yes. Okay. Thunderbolts, Maharaj. You are. You know, my the original question I had was in regard to my ongoing readings of the Chaitanya Bhagavat, but just very briefly, uh, in in response to what you just shared about the distinction, if there be one between the Atma and the Jiva, it was kind of my understanding or impression, which I just wanted to kind of run by you, that the Atman is uh, what uh, what's Najayate Mriyate Vakadachin, unborn, deathless, mm -hmm. pure, ever pure, ever unconditionally pure and uncontaminated by the by the, the three modes of nature, like that. Whereas, by contrast, a jiva, the connotation feels like it's the expression, uh, the partial, temporary, dreamlike expression of, of spirit, of the Atman, like that, uh, which is very much uh, affected uh, and influenced by the three components of nature, etc. Does that kind of resonate with you as well? Yeah, well, the Atma expresses itself in its conditioned life. Uh, we think that uh, its actual contents are, in a sense, uh, pursued by itself, but in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. and it's often described like that, looking for bliss, looking for security or, or being, looking for, for, for knowledge, um, and it resides within the self, mm -hmm. which is... A Particle of, of Bhagawan in, in in whom such uh, such Ananda is, is is fully manifest. Uh, so in that sense, yes. All right, thank you. So the original question I had in my ongoing studies of the Chaitanya Bhagavad is that at this point, I mean, uh, Sri um, Sri Vrindavandas Thakur Mahashai is is um, kind of presenting that like uh, the, the, the Muslim police chief upon being uh, you know questioned by the king, the Muslim king uh, is saying things like, oh yes, I have seen the wandering sannyasi mendicant Chaitanya and his teeth are, are pearly white and so effulgent like, like a thousand moons and this type of thing is coming out of the mouth of the, the Muslim police chief and the king who, in Vrindavan Das Thakur's own words, is the very same one who, de who destroyed and desecrated many, many, many temples in the, um, in the province of Orissa. He's responding to the police chief, oh, you should not think that he is an ordinary mendicant. He is the supreme personality of Godhead. Things of this nature are coming out of Vrindavan Das Thakur is having coming out of the mouths of those who have destroyed and desecrated, you know, the uh, the temples of the in Orissa. And 
so I'm just kind of I I want to get your input about that because in addition to that I mean he has like Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya speaking about the glories of devotional service from the very get-go rather than there being a conversion from mm -hmm. impersonalism to devotion as of course as we know is presented in Chaitanya Charitamrita so mm -hmm. it just it's starting to feel now that you know I don't know I just don't know I, I don't know how much credibility you know his presentation of Mahaprabhu's you know biography carries or holds or should be uh, perceived by us uh, as yeah. as its readers so like that yeah well um, first of all you know there are any number of Muslim kings I'm not sure the particular king uh, in that section was responsible for um, pillaging and so forth they're all kind of kings and sub kings and and so on and so forth. I'd have to look and look that up. Uh, it's not clear to me. And um, that said, um, let's assume that you know he, he, he wasn't one of them. There's many examples of Muslims uh, at the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and thereafter, Muslim leaders and uh, thinkers, artisans and so forth, um, converting to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or staying in their Muslim faith showing great respect for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu about Krishna Leela and so forth. There are some very famous Muslim poets um, who uh, wrote a beautiful glorification of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That history is there. Um, mm. uh, so uh, he did have an effect, you know, on the Muslim population that I said I would say overall was positive. Hari Das Thakur, of course, is the prominent example that's brought out. But there are yes. many other examples on the periphery, if you will. That said, um, these uh, type of texts academically are called hagiographies, and they they um, they have a certain um, uh, purpose, if you will, behind them uh, when they're written, and, and which they seek to um, uh, assert through the biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And therefore they'll adjust different details about his life on the one hand, or on the other hand, uh, they may be, you know, the communications and systems of reporting incidents and so forth are not what they are today. So they may have had different information about events and exactly how they took place and so on and so forth. You have to give some room, you know, to that. Um, uh, uh, you, you take the position of Krishna as Kaviraj Goswami, well, you, you, you're going to be taking that as more definitive, and you could make an argument for that, in that he had the different biographies at his disposal with the di different, slightly divergent historical uh, you know, perspectives and, and so forth, and he put them all together. Of course, his main source of information about Chaitanya Lila was Raghunath Das Goswami and Sarudamana. Now, they were in Puri, but, but Raghunath Das Goswami, of course, was, uh, was well, Surab Damar also, but I think more Raghunath Das Goswami, privy to the ongoings in Navadweep itself, from where he, um, where he spent, you know, uh, time even beyond Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was taking sannyas and later joined him in Jagannath Puri. So he, this is, this is the resource, the principal resource, of uh, Krishna's Kabbalah Goswami and put them in charge of reading. He, 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 he states that Raghunath Das Goswami is his guru. Um, um, so you can make a case, therefore, that historically speaking, if you will, the events are more accurately uh, depicted by uh, 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 Krishna's Kabbalah Goswami. But I wouldn't fault those who, with other information, wrote accordingly. That's the one side. Back to the other side. Well, details uh, be what they may, they're not as important. I don't think historically in Indian thinking uh, as it is in, in, in modern thinking, in Western thinking overall. In fact, uh, uh, in, in, in so many of the quote historical texts as they were thought to be the Puranas in the, in, in the past, you know, take obviously take different positions on issues and, and, and so forth. 
and they seek to capture kind of something else. There's a whole worldview here, you know, that's different than the worldview of modern society. And they seek to bring us, you know, into that worldview and the feeling of it. And, they, and their, their sense is that God appeared in this way and we want to convey the feeling of it. Um, and that's what's important. And let the details, uh, you know, be adjusted if need be in order to make the point. Hmm? And we might do that to some extent as well, uh, in, even in our own times. We might tell a story and adjust the detail in it to overemphasize, as, it, as may need be, uh, a particular point that is inherent in the story that we're telling, but isn't brought out in as great detail um, uh, as, it, as it need be to stress the point. So we may do that to some extent as well. That's how I look at the text and the various uh, uh, differences on historical facts and so forth. Hope that helps. Right. Oh yes, very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Oh, Thank you. Good, good. So another question? Uh, yeah, Connie Ram has a question. Oh, okay. Good morning, Guru Maharaj. Good morning. So my question is a little more general, but it's about chanting the holy name as a service. Uh -huh. uh, so I think that this is about the way I think about chanting the holy name. And I think that when I think of it, it's something that I do for my edification and purification um, but I heard recently that it's something that I'm should think of as being a service so can you explain a little bit about how chanting the holy name is a service and how I should think about it like that well uh, I think that uh, it's an interesting question and it's been aired um, before by others if I recall correctly uh, but I think that uh, the way I think about that um, is that kirtan, hmm? kirtanam means to, to glorify, uh, to give praise, uh, to, you know, of, of, of someone, of God, really is what kirtan, kirtan means, to praise him. So um, uh, if you love someone, right, or you want to express love and affinity, affection for someone, then you speak about their virtues, right? Their qualities, their, what they've done, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, that glorification of them is, in the context that we're talking about it, a service, because the service, what bhakti is, is really a uh, glorification of Krishna uh, overall. With, and with regard to the names in particular, of course, well, we have a sense, philosophical sense that all of the qualities of Krishna are in his name, all of the, uh, the form of Krishna is in his name, the leelas are in his name. So it's a condensed way, if you will, of glorifying, speaking about the virtues, the qualities, the leelas, broadcasting them, just outpouring them. If you love someone, you may sing about them in the shower. Um, or you may hear songs on the radio. I don't know if people listen to the radio anymore, but uh, somewhere on the computer. And then you, you know, you interpret them in the ways that, that relate to your own situation. And, and you make something out of the song that maybe the, the author didn't think was there, but, but it is because you're finding it there and it's about your friend or your, your beloved and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think that, um, we, look, we should look at the kirtan and chanting in the names like that. It's a condensed way, if you will, and a recommended way, given the power of the name and the virtue of the name, the magnanimity of the name, that it comes to us even if we have offended the form and the person. Um, and, and by chanting it, well, we are engaged in, this is the spirit of expressing our affinity for, our affection for, or our longing to be, you know, united with who we understand uh, that which we understand to be our, our source. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, an outpouring of love. You, you, when you say service, it, it kind of gets, you know, how is it a service to sing about somebody that you love? Well, then we have to look at what service is. Mm -hmm. 
What does service mean? I mean, what does it mean? In, in Goloka Vrindavan, it could mean wrestling Krishna to the ground would be a certain, all that is service, right? <laughs> it doesn't look like service, <laughs> but, it, but it, when Radharani doesn't let him into the, gro- into the, into the bower, into the grove, it, 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 it looks like she, or when Mother Yasoda chastises him and binds him in the Prakat Leela, it doesn't look like service, but it is, it's an expression of love because that's an extreme form. Hmm? And so the so singing the names of someone that uh, that we love is you know w- would be um, putting their name you know in the song that we hear something like that is, is the way I look at it. So I think you need to expand uh, the notion of service, what service amounts to. Mm-hmm. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Guru Maharaj. I'll try and <laughs> keep my angle of vision on. <laughs> What else? Sorry, uh, Sharada sent me something. Um, she said a comment. So maybe, d- do you want to make a comment, Sharada, or is this the comment? I may, may, maybe this is the comment. Um, she says, so maybe chanting can be smarnam as well, pranams. Yes, well, that's a good point, actually. Um, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in Shikshastakam, nam nam akari bahuda. Nija Sarva Shakti Tatarpita Niyamita Smarane Nakala. He's speaking about the virtues of chanting the holy name. And he says that uh, the names have all the Shaktis of Bhagavan within them. He's referring to uh, primary names, I would say, of God that speak about him in relation to his devotees, where the Swarup Shakti um, is uh, fully operative, if you will, or manifest. So these powerful names, he says, uh, are not only inherently powerful spiritually beyond comparison, hmm? the implication being invoking of them, chanting of them, um, given that they contain all the power of God within them themselves, uh, there's no other spiritual practice or sadhana that ha- would have the same, uh, same power. Uh, uh, you know, there's a statement um, from Sampuran, I forget, it's very famous, Hare Nam, Hare Nam, Hare Nam, Eva Kebala, Kalo Anasteva, 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 Gatiramita, so it's Hare Nam, Hare Nam, Hare Nam, no other way, no other way, no other way. And sometimes in no other way, no other way, you know, the, no other way, it's explained not by karma, not by jnana, not by yoga. Hmm. But I've also heard it, heard it explained not by uh, uh, um, that, uh, not by the method of Satya Yuga, not by the yuga, method of Tretya Yuga, not by the method of Dwarpa Yuga, hmm? um, which whatever, whatever the Yuga Dharma is for those Yugas, hmm? um, but only in Kali Yuga now, as the verse is, by, by Nam Sankirtan. And along with that, the explanation, the interesting explanation that um, even in Satya Yuga, even in Treta Yuga and even in Dwarpa Yuga, we can find examples in the Bhagavatam of persons, devotees being liberated by chanting. Hmm? Whereas the method of the age in Dwarpa Yuga or Satya Yuga or Treta Yuga will not be efficacious in Kali Yuga. Hmm? Along with the efficacious process in the particular Yuga, Satya Treta or Dwarpa, Harinam is also efficacious if someone should uh, take to Harinam. So another way of sp- explaining the virtues of Nam uh, Sankirtan, um, which we could go on and on about. But in the verse, and relative to uh, Sharada's uh, point, hmm, Mahaprabhu says these names are infinitely powerful, if you will. There are many of them. Hmm, and there's no time, place, or circumstances that are required for doing smaranam of them. He says, smaranena kala. So uh, when we do kirtan, uh, we sing the names out loud. When we do japa, that is thought to be where, where typically the, the, the name is chanted either silently or, or whispering. That's what one can hear it oneself, but others can't. But that is considered to be an anga or a limb of, 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 of uh, 
smaranam. If we would chant out loud in our japa, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was described as doing on his way from Jagannath Puri, or from Navadvi to Jagannath Puri by, by, Chaita, by uh, Rupa Goswami, um, Chaitanya Astakam, I think it is, he had some rope with beads and he would chant on them singing aloud. So that kind of japa, if you will, is a, is a, is a, a limb of kirtan. But the other two, chanting silently on beads or chanting in, uh, to oneself, whispering, those that is considered to be an anga of smarnam. Hmm? And the, the great Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsati Thakur has uh, written a poem, Vaishnav K, who is a Vaishnav. And um, in that poem, he, he makes a very powerful statement. This He says, Kirtana Prabhave Smarana Svabhave. Hmm? That by the power and the force, the spiritual power of kirtan, hmm, smaranam on one's nature that will arise out of the kirtan hmm, uh, will come about automatically. In other words, kirtan will bring one um, more readily um, than any other process into smaranam. While it's external, hmm, speaking out loud, chanting out loud, it will bring us internally. And then internally in meditation, hmm, that uh, it, it, it's taught by Rupa Goswami that internal meditation as it comes about, that should be nourished or strengthened by ongoing kirtan. Hmm. Kirtan will continue to nourish that. And in the highest sense, within the meditation, we'll experience the Leela. Now we're in smarnam, deeply in smarnam, and what do we find? We find kirtan going on in the lila, inside our meditation. And they're chanting, and they're meditating. So, so yeah, they, they're very much complementary, if you will. Shravanam, kirtanam, smarnam, these three go together. Here's the ear, and here, if you can see me, here is the, the tongue, and in between is the mind. <laughs> So uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's going to get captured, if you will. So, um, yeah, so, so chanting the name can also be a, a limb of a smarnam. And it's interesting that Mapu was used that uh, word in his second verse of Shikshastakam because typically smarnam has certain regulations that are sh sh things that should be in place for example, the dhyan or smarnam, as it's described in the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter, uh, sit in a quiet place by oneself, not too high, not too low, uh, so on and so forth. Um, certain directions to face and, and whatnot. These type of, type of criterion are often um, um, invoked. And also a requisite or prerequisite or requirement of having the heart sufficiently purified so that one's desires are not going to take one in the mind, uh, you know, a, a elsewhere. Um, so to say that kirtan can be a form of smarnam and it has no rules or regulations. It's a pretty big statement by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The virtues of the name, I should say. The name is such that it, there are no rules and regulations and you can do the smarnam of the name Mm -hmm. uh, without in any time, any place, any circumstance. So it's a strong statement of Mop. Of course, he goes on to say, but, you know, unfortunately, we don't, despite all this, uh, the efficacy, its power, its generosity, uh, and so forth, we are not uh, attracted to it. Um, and he says the reason is because of, because of an artist, other things have gotten in the way. Mm -hmm. And this we have to look at and see, you know, in all of the, what we do in our practice and as members of the particular Sangha and so forth, where are we in terms of taste for holy name? Uh, where are we in terms of letting go of an artist? Um, this has to be the ultimate evaluation of the health of the individual and, and the Sangha. And, and there's so much room to focus on ourselves and our requirement that, and the more that we're able to do that, the more that there will be harmonious and happy dealings. There's no doubt about that. Um, so good point to focus on. Now, 
hope that helps. Are there any other questions? There is another question, um, not on this topic. Do you want to wait for a follow-up question? It doesn't look like there are any so far. We'll take the next question. Okay, um, so the next question is from Gayatri. Mm -hmm. um, she, her mic's not working well, so she wanted me to read it. So she said, Dandavat Pranams Guru Maharaj, as you have been made aware, I am currently staying in Krishna House in Gainesville. I am repeatedly asked who my spiritual master is, which I gladly share. Some devotees have made an effort to ask further what your opinion is about a disciple of yours taking part in outreach and teachings of ISKCON. Um, the way I've understood it, you had the desire to have an open relationship with ISKCON when you left. Can you please share your thoughts on this matter? How would you like us in our Sangha to interact with and think about ISKCON? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, my uh, thought, and I voiced this before, at the time of leaving ISKCON, ISKCON had an opinion, leadership, that the, uh, the instructions, the Siksha, the advice of Pujapad Sridhar Maharaj would be, would conflict with the managerial um, uh, perspective of ISKCON leaders, and um, the ISKCON leaders had a sense of how ISKCON should be managed and organized and so forth, and that they were deputed to um, oversee that, and that Sridhar Maharaj's input could be uh, come into conflict with that. And um, that was a polite way of saying that, uh, therefore, anyone who wants to take Siksha from Sridhar Maharaj should be outside of the society. Mm -hmm. So they were in pursuit of what they felt was the pure way to follow Prabhupada, they were ready to sacrifice whomever. Mm -hmm. um, if they want, and, and I was a pretty prominent member of this gun, they were, they were prepared to let me go uh, because of their convictions of what was right and what, what Prabhupada wanted. Now, uh, I, of course, disagreed with that. And um, what I thought should have happened was that I thought that ISKCON leadership should have said, okay, well, Trip Armage and others have a different opinion and, uh, and, and there's room for different opinions. They're gonna be separate and um, they're, they're, they're gonna still do the same practices. And, and Prabhupada himself has said, you can be separate from ISKCON, uh, but not from the practices. Mm -hmm. If you have different opinions, so okay, there's precedent for that. And, and, and here they are, these, these devotees, they have a different opinion. Let us be, have a cordial relationship between the two of us and go on down and see you know, what time uh, uh, tells, if you will. Um, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't like that. It became much more um, um, acrimonious and, uh, and there was a lot of vilification of Sridhar Maharaj. Um, and by the leaders, unfortunately. And, and you know, I was not, uh, I didn't sit passively, so I reacted too. But there's been a lot of time since then. You know, that was like 1985. It's, uh, what is it, like 40 years later or something like that now, almost. Um, and, um, and, and that said, um, Chidar Marsh did not want us to disturb Viscon. He felt that it's very difficult to amass a big organization like this and, and all for the purpose of, of broadcasting Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings um, and so on. Um, and so, you know, after all this time and whatnot, uh, I, uh, if anybody wants to be a member of ISKCON, I'm not one to tell them not to be. I, I wouldn't tell them not to be. I wouldn't dissuade them if that was their faith and, and interest. And I think that there are many good things that ISKCON is doing. And, um, and beyond what I, what I can do as a small person. And uh, you know, at the same time, I'm content with what I'm doing. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm better off you know, for it personally. And I, I think a lot of people in ISKCON think I'm pretty well off as well. Um, uh, spiritually speaking. So uh, 
you know, the fact that you, my student, are there and wanted to go there, I had no objection, as you know. And um, and I hope that, you know, uh, that uh, they will honor your uh, 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 commitment to me and so forth, connection with me. And I think that you'll find that mostly among amongst this gun devotees nowadays. Uh, there may be a policy at the top, the leadership, uh, that that is is a little different. Uh, I don't think it's something that they're preoccupied with at, at this time uh, anymore, as they were in the past. Um, so I think um, uh, there there was a time when I first began initiating disciples, 1985, 1986, something like that where if my disciples met some ISKCON devotees on the street, uh, they would just open up and vilify me, you know, upside down and backwards, you know, uh, as deviant, you know, rejecting Prabhupada and so forth. Well, it's just not like that anymore. Hmm? And, um, and that's good. Hmm? And I think, as I say, most devotees will be sensible enough to judge a person, another devotee by their character, their, 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 their characteristics, their qualities, and so on and so forth. And if they hear, oh, he's got a, she's got a guru outside of ISKCON, can't be that bad, look at her. You know? So it's, it's incumbent upon you to be a good disciple. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I think that will help them appreciate um, my perspective to, to you know, basically, the difference is that I accepted Sridhar Maharaj as my Sikh Guru, and that was not allowed in this come. It was encouraged by Prabhupada, um, and that's clear that he told us anybody that wanted the philosophical advice after his departure could go to Sridhar Maharaj. So uh, the GBC disagreed later on. So we have an argument about that or a disagreement about that, but I've been enriched by it, I've been benefited by it. Many people in this come read my books and are nourished by them including leaders, uh, even gurus in ISKCON write me and, and, uh, and uh, thank me for books that I've written and so forth. So I, I think the, the reality on the ground is, you know, these days it's very different. I mean, you can be a father and a mother and have a daughter who, uh, disciples of Prophet, father and a mother, and they have a daughter who's initiated by Narayan Maharaj, who now has a daughter who's initiated by me, you know? So, you know, what do you do? What, what's on the ground? What's happening? Maybe different than some, some policy that was um, put in place, uh, you know, 40 years ago that, uh, that uh, hasn't been revisited and, and it probably won't be. So does that help? Yes, okay, good, good. So be a good student there. I'm sure there's plenty that you can learn. They have a good system there of training devotees in certain ways that um, exceed my ability to do so um, with regard to so many things. Uh, although I think we have a good edge on, on uh, well, well, we have our contribution too. So, okay, what else? Um, I see here there's a comment. Uh, your presence, Ananta Govinda says, in San Francisco, Rat, Rat, Ratiyat was greatly missed. We pray to see you there. He's a member of ISKCON and disciple of Radha Swami. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not going too many places these days. I'm a little more cloistered. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, I had some good times going to the Ratiyatras there in, in San Francisco in days, uh, in previous years. So. What else? Any other question? Um, also, Gayatri wrote something in the chat above Anantya Govinda. You see that? I have met a fair amount of senior devotees who have, were very excited about you being my Guru Maharaj because they are very fond of you and send their love, although I cannot remember the names of now, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, they write to me too. That's very nice. Um, yeah, there's, uh, you know, recently um, I was thinking, I have a, uh, Here's a disciple of my godbrother, uh, Bhakti Gorbana Shingamaraj, who passed away a few years ago. His name is Bhakti Sri Rup Madhav Maharaj. And uh, we're very close. And um, he, um, he was arrested in Nepal on a fake false charge and had spent five years in jail. And I supported him throughout his um, jail time. 
and so forth and communicated with him as much as possible, sending books and so forth. And he's been released now. Um, the case is still pending, but it, it, he'll win and he's in Vrindavan. So he's been in touch with me regularly. Um, he's a, a, a nephew of uh, Barbara Streisand, a famous singer. <laughs> Uh, very nice. But he, he joined when he was 17. Um, and his father was a devotee, but he was against him joining and becoming the Narsingha Maharaj's disciple. We have a long history. It's, it's, it's very funny in many respects and very was challenging at certain times. It's very beautiful. So he's in, in contact with me and, um, and he is um, at the same time a god brother, my Donador Marshal has a place that Govardhan contacted me and um, was able to, he had written an article about um, Prabhupada for an academic journal in which he was emphasizing how uh, the Brahma Bimohan Leela, in which it's asserted, you know, that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the, through the Leela, uh, was, a, was and the prophet left it during the Brahma Mohan Lila. That's what he was translating. Those things, he put those things together and uh, and said that he went out, you know, left the world further giving a microphone to, a megaphone to his principal uh, teaching Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam, something like that. And he asked my opinion about it and I shared it with, he shared it with me and I appreciated it and I sent him something that I had written also on the Brahma Mohan Lila a little bit from my forthcoming book, which he very much liked. And so we, he, he, he said, oh, we need books like this. And it was a little bit too flattering for my liking, but um, he was sincere in it. And, um, and so we got to talking a little bit and he mentioned that he had a place in Govardhan. So I, I uh, you know, I had the idea, you well, know, I should have a place in Govardhan of all places because it's a little more removed from Vrindavan, which has become so busy and, and so forth. In my early days in Vrindavan, it was just, you know, very, very, very rural and you'd never see a car there at all and so forth. And I missed that. So I had been thinking at times that I have a little place at Govardhan. And because he has one, and we got to talking about it. And he told me it was like that, you know, compared to Vrindavan. And my other concern was, well, you get further out in Vrindavan, it can't be, and it's not always a safe place. Hmm? Um, you can get robbed and, and, and so forth. He said it was safe, and, and there were other devotees he mentioned, such as Nandan Swami and another one, Buri John Das. These are godbrothers of mine, and I know that they had places out and around Govardhan. Then I looked a little bit at the geography, and I saw Govardhan is like central to Vrindavan, to Barsana, place of Radharani, and Nandagram. It piqued my interest a little bit more. And um, so I told Madhav Marsh, to ask him, please meet with Donovan Marsh out there at the end of September. I mean, I don't have any funds or anything to do that, but it's you know something that I've thought about. And um, I bring it up because when I was talking with Donovan Marsh and he was mentioning these other devotees, they had their places out there. And he said they were you know largely non-sectarian. Donovan Marsh himself is not inside ISKCON, but he, he's on the much more on the fringe of it, if you will, than, than I am. And he keeps close contact with many devotees who are the more open-minded leaders of his God. So I started thinking, yeah, I, mean, I could interact with some of them out there in a non-sectarian space. Um, they have some plots, some acreage, and they do retreats and so forth. And I, I found a Govardhan retreat on YouTube that they did. And I listened to it. Um, there's different speakers and so forth. So I started, I had this like, well, yeah, maybe I could, you know, um, interact with them um, in, in ways that, uh, you know, haven't for years. So yeah, uh, who knows what'll happen, right? Especially, you know, the God brothers, the God sisters of Prabhupada, a dear God sister of mine, her son, who's very dear to me also, um, Jagadatri and her son, Raghunath, who was, one of the original and older boys in the group who, who joined, they joined the Los Angeles temple. She joined New Dwarka was called with her son who was like eight years old, a bit of a terror, but he lived in the Brahmachari ashram with us. And I always uh, was very affectionate to him. Prabhupada was as well. Over the years, um, we had, as he grew up, we had uh, maintained a very affectionate relationship and his, and his mother was a book distributor 
these are the early days in, 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 in Los Angeles book distribution. So we're, she always had a strong feeling for me. So he just notified me the other day that she was passing away from, uh, you know, departing, if you will. So, uh, you know, we're all, I could depart at any time. We had a cow here, uh, Daniel, our original Jersey cow. One morning, one night she just passed out from a stroke and Matt found her like that. So I could pass away at any time myself. I'm 73 years old. I, I, I'm in good health overall, I would say. But anyway, God, brothers, God, sisters, of mine, they get older. You, you get older and you, you you think a little differently. You're younger, you're a little more militant about things, even about the philosophy, perhaps. A little older, you get a little more open. And, and um, I'm experiencing that too. So... Um, anyway, Gayatri, I'm happy that you're there and happy that you met some nice devotees who will uh, appreciate uh, your connection with me. You're doing a good service for me by being there and setting a good example. Anyway. Okay, someone has written here, Gayatri said, Mahabhava was one of the senior Madhajis that sends her love. Oh yeah, well, they got a long history with her. Her face was most radiant when she spoke about you, Guru Maharaj, and it made me feel full of love. Yeah. Yeah, she, I was very kind to her, and she's a, she's a very good soul unto herself as well. In Seattle years ago, very, very nice that she's there and she's active. I'm very, very pleased to hear that. So, what else? Any other questions? I don't have any other questions. Um, maybe someone will send one or, yeah. Okay, well, uh, again, if uh, I reiterate what I said at the beginning, if anyone needs to contact me about anything, feels disturbed about some of the things that went on earlier, uh, and continue in some people's minds and hearts, please feel free to contact me directly. And um, uh, I have a question, Bill Marsh. On the court, oh, philosophical question, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, there's, you know, there's the two, broadly speaking, the two types of yoga. There's the Chit yoga of Patanjali, and then, of course, there's the, the yoga of action that Krishna espouses in the Gita. So I was kind of, uh, and uh, Edwin Bryant, you know, Advaita Das, made the point, really nice point, that I thought uh, he said something like, when I sit to do Japa at 5 a.m., it's Chit Sivir and 9 to 5, it's yoga of the Gita which is very practical and nice encapsulation. Um, so I was thinking like, like when we're chanting Japa uh, in Patanjali's yoga, um, he said Samadhi is the means of purifying the chitta, stilling the mind. And so it got me thinking, well, how much, when we're chanting the name, you know, the name is said to be efficacious in and of itself, but then how much of that efficacy is coming from the samadhi aspect? Or is it, in other words, uh, we see devotees chanting for years and years, and maybe if they've never entered into samadhi proper chanting the name, then they're not really getting the purification that they would otherwise. Does that make any sense? I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that the samadhi is, uh, is, uh, in and of itself, the only thing that removes some scars. Sadhana removes some scars, and the culmination of that removal of some scars and the clearing of the of the chitta, if you will, results in samadhi, mm -hmm. um, which, mm -hmm. uh, so you, I don't think you can disregard the cleansing of the heart that reaches the point where the heart is cleansed, where one has the capacity to experience um, samadhi, which which obviously is only going to further uh, cement one, if you will, in a spiritual understanding and uh, and, and and spiritual experiential life and orientation to it. So, I mean, of course, Krishna also speaks in in the Gita about Dhyana Yoga. So, the sixth chapter is, is basically about what Pat Patanjali is talking about. The only difference there right. is the uh, Patanjali emphasizes the Ishwar. Uh, Krishna comes out and says, I'm the Ishwar <laughs> of the yoga, uh, very, very clearly, and he's instructing Arjun, he identifies himself as such. But otherwise, prior to that, 
he's talking about nishkam karma, so the active life in which, uh, which is very user friendly because we're active by nature. We're, 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 we have a certain momentum from the past of moving in the world in relation to sense objects. So how to continue doing that, but in a way that will serve as a yoga that will cleanse our heart and free us from attachments. So by doing it dutifully, this would typically refer to in, in the setting of the Gita, the duties of the Varna, of a Varnashram person, right? So they would do the duties, but not with the idea, which is karma, but not with the idea that by doing them, they're gonna improve their life or by not doing them, their life will be inhibited uh, in terms of being improved, knowing that what they're, that beyond that is, uh, is the Atma and, uh, and spiritual life and so forth. And if in the context of Nishkam Karma, you, you add to that, not only not being attached to the fruits, but offering the fruits, whatever, you know, good results come, money or whatever, you know, to, to, to Krishna, then it becomes, uh, you know, uh, um, a, a beginning of bhakti, if you will. So um, Krishna, yeah. yeah, Krishna has emphasized Nishkam Karma Yoga uh, because one of the reasons, because there's a lot of, it's, it's easy to hear the philosophy, think I'll just be a sannyasi, that sounds great. <laughs> so I'll just take sannyasa and I'll just meditate, you know. And then you find out it's not so easy, but you've already done that. And then you got then you have to imitate and you know and and, um, and pretend that you're something you're not. And it, and it shows up and it's problematic and so forth. So he militates against the mathyachara suyuchate, you know. So he says, uh, so, so his strong emphasis on this kind of karma is very very practical, but having passed through that and purified the heart, then he does speak about dhyan. So, you know, in our practice, well, uh, you know, we have some time to sit and do and, and do the dhyan of our mantra, the, of the maha mantra, or of our addiction mantra, and so forth. And that's, uh, you know, that's our time in meditation where we can evaluate how, how we've conducted ourselves through the day, if you will. Um, and then that if it's done well, then the, the, the meditation on not that will affect the day going forward, and so it's kind of back and forth. Got to connect the two. Hmm. Hope that helps. So, so you, would you say that the primary driver then of being able to enter into samadhi is how we conduct ourselves in the bulk of our lives? Well, I think that that's that's a good part of it, but you know, there's some. To the extent that you're able to then sit down and and, and, and actually meditate, hmm? um, you know that, that your mind is focused on on that, which is important for me. It was always like I would have responsibilities within ISKCON to do, like book distribution, even for example, um, and do that. And then it, whenever I got a chance to not do that and worship the deity, do kirtan, japa, for me that was like the joy. I mean, there was a lot of joy in the book distribution too that came by getting absorbed in it, but um, it was hard to, uh, to do. Or other tasks, uh, you know, whatever, driving the car or this, that, or the other thing, you know. For me, it was always when I got a chance to sit and chant now, you know. Oh. So, uh, uh, you know, they, yeah, they, they, we should conduct ourselves such that that's the way we feel, um, but it has to be real. And it can't be just an excuse. I don't want to do this or that. I just want to, if you have a real service attitude, then uh, you, you, you'll like the chanting. And ultimately, you'll, you'll, you'll embrace the service as well, whatever it is. There was a stage also where I just did things that I didn't like to do hmm, because it was a service and I should like it hmm, because it's service to Krishna. I did that for, for quite a while also. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I think uh, to, uh, to, to enter into samadhi is easier said than done, and um, it is our ob objective, but it's more of a more of a goal. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a dhyan that constitutes features of, of of practice, and there's dhyan that constitutes aspects of perfection. Mm -hmm. Samadhi, Dhruvana Smriti, I think Jiva Goswami uses the term. Those are things that you can't, um, 
imitate. You can think about Krishna. You can try to fix the mind on Krishna. You can try to take your mind off of things that are not related to Krishna and so forth, pratyahara, um, and so forth as, as part of sadhana. But you, you can't just sit down and do samadhi. <laughs> you know, when you sit down and do samadhi for a while, it's not, it's not so easy. You have, to, you have to do the things that will cleanse the heart to enable that to happen. All right, so that does bring us to the end of the session. Nice to be with all of you, and I hope to be available next week as well. Hare Krishna. Road Thank you. Road Hare Bo. Hare Bo. Hare Bo. Hare Bo. Okay. Okay. Um, so just let's see. Stop.